Good morning or afternoon or could be evening if you're watching this in the replay. I'm Chef AJ and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm very excited about today's guest because she is my shero. And, and you know, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people, just like Colin Campbell last week, I said, well, who influenced you to be who you were? And he mentioned his parents. And you know, you always hear me talk about the big three, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, McDougal, Lyle, and Goldhammer, who really did shape so much of my career. But I look up to this person so much. She's just I, she just embodies everything that you want to be in a human, in a vegan. She's also a, a recipient of the uh, In the Vegan Hall of Fame, which was an honor that I received a few years ago. She is accomplished in so many areas. She's a best-selling author. She has been a restaurateur. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she's a, she's an animal activist. I mean, there's really, she has her finger in so many pies that she's going to have to have a couple more hands pretty soon. I've never seen anybody that works as hard or that is is so busy. She's as beautiful as she is talented. She's been doing a daily cooking show in quarantine every day on her Facebook page. She's the author of five books. Only four are in print right now, but one will be coming out someday soon. And hopefully she'll come back and maybe even do a few recipes from it. One of her books is called Now in Zen Epicure. You can just see how cute she is. This is a fabulous book, to, oh, especially in quarantine, to save money making your own staples vegan pantry. But the book I think that put her on the map that I remember buying in bulk from her publisher one year to give us all my holiday gifts is Artist Vegan Cheese. She is to vegan cheese what Thomas Edison is to the light bulb, what uh, Alexander Graham Bell is to the telephone. Please welcome Miyoko Shinner. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thanks, Chef AJ. I think that's probably the best introduction anyone's ever given me, but I would expect no less of you. So uh, <laughs> that is exactly what AJ would say. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for delivering that so brilliantly. Yeah. Well, I really mean it from my heart and I'm wearing a shirt you gave me. I really, I, I admire you so much. I look up to you and that, you know, when I grow up, I want to be you because it's like you do embody business, compassion, ethics, good. I mean, you're every, you're really, you're like MasterCard. You're everything I want to be. So <laughs> How do you do it all though? There's only 24 hours in the day. How do you even do your life? I just can't imagine. You know, it just I think just like you too, I, I think we operate out of passion and we have a mission. We have something that we really care about. Uh, it, it carries you through the day, through the day, through the weeks, through the months, through the years. And you just keep going because it has to be done. It has to be done now more than ever in the time of COVID. You know, we have to put an end to animal agriculture to save everything, save the planet, save our health, uh, save our, save us from having future pandemics, and, and of course, above all, to save the animals. That's what it's all about. You even have a tattoo. I do. There we go. There. Phenomenally vegan. There. I love it. And you're fun and you're in good shape too. And you get, you still, you still manage to exercise. My guess is the only thing that you probably don't do enough of, I'm guessing is sleep. Well, yeah, I don't exercise like I used to either. I mean, you know, I used to like hit the gym regularly. Um, I'm out on a ranch now. Uh, at, at, we, I have a farmed animal sanctuary, Rancho Compassion, as you know. And so my workouts uh, often consist of flipping bales of, of hay uh, you know, feeding animals, um, pushing wheelbarrows up a hill, that kind of thing. Um, and I try to get a little bit of running in with my dogs at the same time, but climbing a few ropes, I, I'm pretty good at climbing ropes still. And I got monkey bars. I can still do that. So, but not, yeah, not in my, not in the same shape I was five years ago. Um, you know, I wouldn't want to do tough mutter now, put it that way. And in your spare time, you raised three wonderful children, just on the side yeah well that was a while back you know they're older now so they're in their they're in their 20s and one of them actually uh works at the sanctuary the youngest is uh does all this she, she uh is one of the sanctuary employees does all the social media for it as well um so a very empathetic human being um and so i feel grateful that you know, that i'm able to have have her uh as part of my life that's great so when did Miyoko's creamery start and how did it start? Um, yeah, so it started six years ago from the book that you showed, um, Artisan Vegan Cheese. Um, people were, um, I wrote the book because I had had many businesses. I, as a serial entrepreneur, I started my first business in my mid 20s in Japan. And I had experienced a number of, let's just say failures, just, you know, just never really able to uh, generate 
enough revenues to to pay myself. So I had a business before with 50 employees. I paid them all, but I never paid myself. And uh, and so I really didn't feel like I had the Midas touch. Um, I had just the opposite. Everything I touched turned to ash. And so I was determined not to start a business, but I wanted to empower people to go into their own homes and make their own vegan cheese because cheese is the last hurdle. So I wrote the book, Artisan Vegan Cheese, became a cult classic, and people just kept asking me. They were like, I love the book. It's a hassle to make the cheese. Can't you just please start one more business? So eventually I gave in and I started the business, and this time it has just skyrocketed. So I feel grateful in every single way. Well, it really did fill a need because, you know, you're a long time vegan like me. For me, it's 43 years. And, you know, one of the things I say is, well, I'd be vegan except for cheese. So you have filled that niche. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I, even though I hardly ever eat cheese anymore, I'm glad I'm filling that niche for everybody else. Why do you think it's so tough for people to give up cheese? Well, I think we know. I mean, one uh, it, and it's, by the way, cheese is not eaten in every culture. I mean, I grew up in a culture where we didn't eat cheese and it was rather strange to eat cheese. The first time I ever had cheese, I thought it was gross. So, you know, uh, but it is eaten all over the world now. And we do know about casomorphine, uh, you know, the opiate that's in, that's released when uh, casein, milk protein breaks down the body, it gives you that feel good feeling. And so there's a biological addiction that can happen to cheese, but at the same time, it's part of our cultural heritage. It's in so many foods. It's a comfort food. And people like things that are fatty and gooey and stretchy and just uh, you know, very rich. It just satisfies in a way that, let's just say, steamed kale won't. Like <laughs> People don't rush to steamed kale with lemon juice as a comfort food. You know, You might feel great after eating it, but it's not what you desire when you're going through a stressful day. And I think, you know, especially in a time of this pandemic, and we, we have seen cheese consumption go up. And I think it's because people are stressed out. Um, yeah. People are needing that, that, you know, that thing that makes them feel better. Right. We say people like things that are fatty and gooey and stretchy. If they eat too much, they become fatty, gooey and stretchy. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I yeah. think it's the salt too, don't you though? I think it's the combination of the fat and salt. Yes, absolutely. The salt. If you just had the fat without the salt, it wouldn't be as good. So you have to have all of those, you know, in combination. Yeah. So Kathy's asking if you have a favorite cheese. I'm guessing maybe she means of your line. Um, well, one of them, yeah, I think my favorite really is the black ash. So when I really want, I like fancy cheeses when I want something that's really, uh, you know, um, I don't know, an educated cheese, a cultured cheese. I, I definitely go for the black ash. Um, and that one, by the way, has no added oils either. So yeah, that, that was a question we had um, because there are some people, maybe they're on Dr. Esselstyn's program, they can't have oil or nuts. Do you have or do you anticipate having a lower fat line for some people? Yeah, so I mean, one, one of the things that gets cheese to melt, of course, is the fat. Without the fat, it, it doesn't melt. But in the homemade vegan pantry, I actually have several recipes for meltable cheeses that are nut based. So they do have natural fat in it, but they're whole foods. It's just out of cashews water. There's no added oils at all. Um, and so that's a, a really great place to start. Um, we are, I'm playing around with another um, novel ingredient right now and, um, and seeing what we can do with that. Um, and I just made a mozzarella that had no added oils. Um, it, the, the melting capability is a little bit compromised, um, of course, uh, but it, this, uh, it's lower in fat than cashews. It's another, it's a, it's a seed. Um, and it works beautifully. So it's something that we may be developing in the future. Right. Someone yeah. says, I love Miyoko, such an amazing, wonderful woman. Couldn't agree more. First time I saw her was a chef demonstrator at a 10 day McDougal program. She came in speaking Japanese and freaked us all out. Oh, that's, yeah. I used to play this little shtick. I put on a kimono and I would come in. We always did a Japanese class because Japanese food is by and large, not only low in fat, but there's oftentimes no oil used. In many, many, many Japanese dishes, there's no oil used at all. Now there is soy sauce or salt, but there's no oil used in, in much of it. And so that was so easy to cook oil-free using Japanese uh, dishes. So you just have to avoid tempura. 
And so I used to do this thing. I'd come in wearing a kimono and I would come in. And I would just start speaking like two, two octaves above and speaking really fast in Japanese. And people would be like, am I in the wrong, am I in the wrong room? Like what's going on here? She's, and then I, I, I start, you know, and I tear off my kimono and then people burst out laughing. But anyway. Oh my God. You're, you're a natural entertainer. I remember I've had you a couple of times when I used to do conferences and you were always just a, such a big hit. So Adina asks if you've ever tried using chestnuts because they are a nut and, but they're also low in fat. And have you ever thought yeah. about that? Yeah, actually I haven't used chestnuts. That's a really great idea. Uh, definitely. That's something you could, yeah, they are very, very, they're very starchy. So that's a really great idea. I've never tried chestnuts. I don't really know if they are a nut. Are they a nut? I'm good. After I ask the next question, I will Google it. But I, yeah, I, I, it. I do a recipe every Wednesday. I do a little YouTube pre-recorded show called Weight Loss Wednesday. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow's recipe is the Thai peanut sauce that I developed using chestnuts. And it's really, really good. Really? Because yeah, so I'll, I'll look up if it's truly a nut. When yeah. I ask this question from Kelly, she's debating, has a debate with her mother whether vegan cheese can cause constipation like regular cheese. I've never heard that before. That's interesting. Um, huh. I do not know. I mean, that, and it depends on what kind of vegan cheese you're talking about because. If you're talking about the standard, you know, we just launched these slices and shreds that are oat milk and legume based, but most of the slices and shreds on the market are just oil and starch put together. So when you say vegan cheese, are you talking about that? Or are you talking about uh, the kind that you'd make at home or the kind that we sell that are whole cashews that are cultured? Um, Cause that has fiber in it. I can't imagine that, you know, basically you're eating nuts. So I can't imagine that would cause constipation, but. Mm. Right. So I Googled if chestnuts were a nut and all it said is chestnuts are in a different botanical category to peanuts and also to tree nuts. So I have no idea what it is. So if you guys know, maybe put it in the chat. Yeah. So if they're in a different botanical, it doesn't sound like they're a nut. If they're not a tree nut and they're not a peanut, peanuts a legume. So it's got to be something else. Yeah. We'll yeah. see if we can find out. So yeah. tell us about the daily show you've been doing uh, when you started, where people can access it. Sure. So it, it's it's not daily anymore, but it was for about uh, seven weeks. And so right when COVID hit and shelter in place was about to take off, um, we real you know all of a sudden. I mean, I was like you, AJ, traveling all the time. I was on the road constantly. All of a sudden, my my calendar cleared up for about two weeks because I had all these conferences I was supposed to go to and things, and everything cleared up. But you know, you know, in terms of our social media after coronavirus hit. We were thinking about how do we, you know, how should we um, present ourselves on social media and in marketing? What should our messaging be at this in this period when people are having to isolate, self-isolate when they're when they're maybe going through the illness themselves? When um, you know society is no longer what we thought it was <clears throat> or how we want it to be, and we thought, okay, what what can we do to bring comfort into people's homes? What can we do? Instead of sell, 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 try our great cheese, it's fantastic. What can we do to really show people that we care? And so we had the idea that I would just start doing cooking classes every single day of how to cook with basics. How do you make your own bread? How do you cook with beans? How do you how do you do this stuff? And we just started doing, we just came up with it one day, Miyoko's Home Comforts. No planning, no production company, my daughter with my iPhone. Uh, me waking up every morning thinking, okay, what do I have in my fridge? What do I have in my cupboard? I didn't get this, you know, I couldn't go grocery shopping. Let me just throw something together. And we just started doing these shows and they have been really, really popular, you know, sometimes. Um, and then we started doing these uh, happy hours on Fridays, um, sometimes featuring um, other companies, other products, other wines, um, not other wines, but wines uh, to go with our cheeses. And really creating this community that just seemed super important. So you can catch us on Miyoko's um, Facebook page, or you can go to our Instagram. I think it's Miyoko's Creamery. Just look for that. And I you'll just found it on Facebook. I'm gonna put the link to it right now because yeah. I'm imagining they could watch past shows there as well. Yeah, you can also watch past shows on YouTube. So um, we're, we're gonna be, we're down to three days a week now just because I'm getting busy again. 
Um, and uh, it honestly, it's a, it's a lot to plan a cooking show every single day to, to wake up in the morning and go, what am I making today? And oftentimes it's really that it's because there's no production team that's saying, why don't you make this? And let me prep this for you. No, you know, none of it's being prepped or anything. It's just sort of, then it's like my kitchen's a mess. It's like, oh my God, because I'm living in this household with three other people. And even though I've got two, two uh, 20 something ladies, young women, you know, my daughter's living with me and my husband, no one seems to be able to clean up. And so it's like this mad rush to get the kitchen clean when I have to do another show and it gets a little tiring after a while, you know. Are they on three? Are, are, is it like Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Are there three particular? Days? Yeah, it, it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday now. Yeah. yeah. And what time is the show at? If we it's want on to... at three p.m. PT and six p.m. ET. That's so great. Out. I mean, there are people that wake up in Ireland and they, you know, they say that's the first thing they do is they watch uh, this Facebook Live. So I, it's it's really been about it's it's different from just a cooking show because because it is Facebook Live. You know, we try to create community. People get to ask questions. Um, we have a conversation, um, so people feel included, and you know they love being able to get a sneak peek into my cupboards. And you know, oh my God, her refrigerator is a mess, and it's kind of fun that you know because it's not so scripted and perfect. That's so great. And it's well, not just cooking. We talk about issues. You know, we talk about um, what's going on in. Um, in the world of, with coronavirus, and we talk about animal agriculture. We talk about what's going on with the slaughterhouses right now, um, and the social justice issue around, uh, you know, the indentured servants in these um, environments. And um, it, it, this is really the time for veganism to take off. If if not now, when? I mean, I really do believe this is. We are now embarking on the end of animal agriculture. This is the beginning of the end of of um, this act, this form, this food system that is um, enslaved animals and indentured uh, and, and basically enslaved people too. Damn, uh, that's I couldn't I couldn't wish for anything more. You know, I, I created the show for the same reason to create a sense of community, and I put a poll out to see what time people preferred. And believe it or not, three p.m. Pacific time won with forty two percent. And I said, I'm not going up against Miyoko. So the second. Really? Yeah, the second choice was 11 a.m. So that's the time that we do it now. Okay, and so did you start also because of COVID? Right, so so it was March 20th, the day that the first day sheltering began, and I reached out to my community. And because I'm not very tech savvy and I should wear glasses and I don't, I pushed the wrong button and it went everywhere. And I'm like, uh-oh, and people liked it. And I so I started doing it. But then after doing it three times, I was like, I'm kind of tired just me talking. So I emailed a few friends right. and they came like Robert Cheek and then you and people wanted to come on and then they told their friends and so on. And so now I'm like booked for this next several months and I plan to do it every day as long as I can. I mean, because I'm not, nobody's traveling right now. So I'm home. Right. Right. So you, but you're doing it on zoom. I'm doing it on zoom. Right. But okay. it goes to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So I call, I call these, these nice people, my zoomunity, because a lot of them are becoming friends with each other. And we see this, a lot of the same, well, they're not seeing their faces, but the names every day. So it's, it's like a, like family. So it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. it yeah. really is one way to create community. And we have to realize, you know, that there's, this community is all over the world. Um, yep. So Gina wants to know where your ranch is and is, can people visit it? Yeah, so it's called Rancho Compasión. It's a 501c3 nonprofit farmed animal sanctuary. Right behind me, you see Reggie. He's, he's my boyfriend goat. He's a very, very good kisser. Um, it's funny, goats love to smell human breath. So they'll often just put their mouth right next to yours. And they just like you to breathe into it. Um, but anyway, it, we're in Nicasio, California. That's in, uh, it's in Northern California. We're about 40 minutes Northwest of San Francisco. And yes, typically we are open to the public, uh, but right now, you know, we're closed uh, to the public. Uh, we do have volunteers who come still uh, with proper social distancing. And we have about 80 animals. Um, we have cows and pigs, goats, sheep, ducks, geese, and um, turkeys, chickens, donkeys. Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. The animals get a second chance to live. And uh, we, this weekend was very, very hard for me because um, we lost 
one of our beloved animals, um, Oliver the pig. Um, I, I can't talk about it right now, um, but it was, uh, it just, to me, just, it uh, exemplified what's wrong with animal agriculture. What I learned so much from our veterinarian um, who, uh, it, you know, basically explained that there, I mean, I already knew this, but there were, there's two paths for a veterinarian. When you go to vet school, you can either do small animals, which are like household pets and, you know, rabbits, that sort of thing. Or you can go to food animals. That's the other track, food animals. They're not farmed animals, they're food animals. And they don't know a lot about food animals because the veterinary practice is only about keeping animals alive long enough until you slaughter them. So they don't know a lot about animals like pigs and cows when they reach an age that's past normal slaughter. Um, is they have, why, why should you learn? Because you're gonna slaughter them anyway. Um, there, there's just a lot wrong with it. it. It just creates an opportunity for animals to have no opportunity. They have, there's no, they have no chance, um, which is where, you know, sanctuaries come in right now with um, the coronavirus and the slaughterhouses, you know, people, I mean, the farmers are, they're going to kill 10 million hogs in this country. Those hogs never have a chance um, either, you know, because they're too large for the processing lines. Um, they don't have an opportunity ever to experience love not one day in their lives will they ever experience love. What kind of life is that to come into? Um, it's the same with all of these animals. Um, it's, it's absolutely horrific. So when, you, when you're on a sanctuary, you learn so much about, you learn more about the system than, than you want to. Um, and the saving grace is that the animals on the sanctuary have a wonderful life and they love you and they, they share that affection. They share the love and you see how they, they are transformed. Um, sometimes from animals that were very shut down when they arrived to open caring beings that want nothing more than a belly rub or to hang out with you, go on a hike with you. We have a cow that was, went on a jog with my husband a couple of weeks ago. That's beautiful. A lot of people, myself included, are saying they're very sorry for your loss. Um, I see a documentary in your future. Possibly, yes, yeah. There's been a couple of uh, documentarians that have come to the sanctuary to film. I, I don't know what's going on with the films, but yeah, it's not about, yeah, it's it's really more about the animals, the story. You know, it's it's the work that we all have to do in our own way. You're doing it in your way, AJ. I'm sure your viewers are doing their work in some way. You know, we all have a role to play in transforming this world. We really do. Mm. Dina Marie says she visited a sanctuary near her that had Esther the pig, the, the famous ah. pig. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd love to meet Esther someday. Yeah, but Patricia says, what a fantastic woman with a beautiful heart. Debbie says, Miyoko, you are such a compassionate person. So sorry for your loss. Back to chestnuts for a minute. Kimberly says there were fruit. I'll buy that. That makes sense. That does make sense. Yes, yes. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question on your tattoo, the meaning behind it. So the meaning behind Phenomenally Vegan really is that uh, up until now, up until recently, even now, you know, I mean, there's this whole debate between vegan and plant-based. And I, I've always walked the line that the word plant-based is an industry concocted term to uh, uh, take the fear out of the word vegan, you know, or actually because you're afraid of the, because pe people say, well, vegan has all this baggage. And what I'm trying to show is that the word vegan is beautiful and we can elevate it. We can make it phenomenally vegan um, because it's, it's not just about uh, avoiding animal products or about food. It's about an entire lifestyle that's based on compassion, caring for all living beings. Um, it's the beauty that's in, in it, it's about living a life that cares. 
about caring for others. It's not just plant-based can sometimes just mean my own health. Like I want to be healthy. I'm going to eat plant-based. That's great. But your health really doesn't matter if the world crumbles, if animals are dying, if climate change isn't reversed, if there are pandemics, you know what? It doesn't matter if you've got, uh, you know, uh, washboard abs and if you lose a hundred pounds, I mean, it just like, just doesn't matter. Yes, of course our health does matter. I'm, you know, I'm being partly facetious because if you don't, if you're not healthy, if you don't feel good, you're not gonna be able to go out there and be a great example or fight for the animals or fight for human, for justice. But, but health is just a part of it. Our own personal health is only a small part of a much bigger picture. And that bigger picture is vegan. So that's why I have this tattoo. And when people stop me like one time, like, you know, people ask me about this tattoo on the street, they go phenomenally vegan. You're, does, you're vegan. What, what does that mean? I always go, Oh my God, you're not vegan. Oh my, you are so losing out. You got to try it. It is phenomenal. It's amazing. It's like everyone is FOMO. Like they don't want to miss out. So you got to tell them how phenomenally vegan you know, the experience that they're missing. And instead of like, you know, being defensive or feeling like there's so much baggage, when you can wear your phenomenally vegan tattoo on your arm. And I got this when I turned 60, by the way. Um, it was my first tattoo, I waited till I was 60 to do it. Um, you know, that's when you can really convince people, um, you know, you get them to laugh and, and they get excited about it. Um, but we have to remove the baggage. We have to make veganism the most exciting club that you can join. And it's free. So I tell everyone that. That's you beautiful. too can join the club. <laughs> well, that's beautiful. You're a shining example. I always, not, I don't always wear this shirt. I have more than this shirt, but I can't think of a day that I don't have something on me that says I'm vegan, whether it's these vegan earrings from Linda Middlesworth, but there's always something on me so that it can start a conversation. And I've done that for pretty much my whole life. Yes. Yeah. It's absolutely critical to get that conversation started now more than ever. And I'm finding that more and more people who are not vegan are now talking about it. I mean, I was in this um, Zoom happy hour with some neighbors and this woman says, you know, I'm not vegan, but I've been reading these articles about, and I read this article in the New York Times about the slaughterhouses or the end of animals or whatever. And, and then I just made this vegan recipe and my husband loved it. So <clears throat> everyone's talking about it these days. I mean, people are receptive now because they know this can't continue. So this is, this is the beginning of the end of animal agriculture. Well, you and me are the OGs, you know? That's the, the OGs, yes. Yeah, that's original gangsters. That's yeah, what that's original, what I'm just not up on my acronym. Well, I'm not up on it either, but so many kids have called me that that I just read really? it up. Yeah, you're the OG when well, it that's comes to That's because you were in LA for a long, for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a farm girl out in the countryside. So, so cute. So we have a couple of cheese questions. So Diana yeah. says, hi, Miyoko. I made a couple of your cheeses and I'm not sure I did it right. The rejuvelac tasted sour and bad and made the cheese taste that way. Do you have any tips on making perfect rejuvelac? Well, I, so rejuvelac should taste sour. I mean, it should taste tangy, not sour. And it could be that the temperature was wrong. When you have lactic acid bacteria growing, there are hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of bacteria and they love different temperatures. So it could, so if you don't have it at the right temperature, rejuvelac usually from a grain typically grows between 70 and 90 degrees, uh, not much higher and not much lower. If you, if it was too low in temperature, it's very possible that um, the other, some other bacteria grew or it could have been, and that gave it a bad flavor. It, or it could have been that your, um, your jar wasn't clean. Um, so fermentation is, is a learning curve. Um, rejuvelac is not hard to make, um, but you do have to make sure that it's at the right temperature. Thank you. There was another question about, is there a special way to work with the aged cheeses in hot, humid climates? No, not really. Um, you know, temperature is everything. So if you're trying to age a cheese um, in a hot, humid climate, and you do want a certain amount of humidity, um, invest in a wine cooler and you can age your cheeses in there. Uh, cheeses age best at around 55 degrees. So you don't want it to be too hot. You don't want it to be too cold either. 
Sure. And, and people are asking, where can they buy your Miyoko's Creameries products? Uh, all over the country, um, just about anywhere. Um, uh, so we're at Target, Kroger, Walmart, um, Whole Foods, Sprouts, Trader Joe's. Uh, uh, we're in about 15,000 stores, so should be pretty, and all, most natural, uh, about 98% of the natural food stores in the country. So um, you shouldn't have a problem finding them. What's your best seller? Our best selling product actually is something that you would not recommend because it's pretty much all oil. It's our European style cultured vegan butter, which is actually the best selling uh, plant-based butter on, in the marketplace as one skew, as a single skew. Well, I'd certainly recommend it to somebody that wasn't vegan. I mean, th I mean, I'd recommend it over butter. You can bet that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Right. So um, a question from Gypsy, can you, can, can, are your cheeses sold anywhere other than the United States? Can they be purchased in Japan? Uh, no, but they're, they are available. I mean, they're available in Canada. They're available in uh, select stores in Hong Kong. And uh, I, I believe uh, Thailand, there's a couple of other countries in the, uh, in, in Southeast Asia that carry the product. Can we buy stock in your company? No, unfortunately. I mean, we have institutional investors. I mean, that would have been like the very, very beginning when we had friends and family rounds. But at this point, no, it would just be, yeah. Uh, maybe if we go public, like Beyond Meat, we, you know, we're not sure what's going to happen in a few years. Oh boy, well, I'll, I'll be ready to buy a few shares. Stephanie says, I've heard the dairy industry in the past has tried to ban the use of the word cheese for plant-based versions. They try to do that with milk too. Have you ever had any opposition to the verbiage on your product? Of course. Right now we have a lawsuit against the Calif uh, California Department of Food and Agriculture. We got a letter from the, Department of Calif the California Department of Food and Agriculture last December telling us that we couldn't use the word butter uh, because the word butter belonged to the dairy industry and that we had to uh, remove any images uh, of uh, farmed animals from our marketing material and our website. We had a picture of um, a volunteer at Rancho Compassion hugging a cow, caressing the head of a cow, one of our rescue cows on our website. We were told that we had to remove that image from our website because pictures of cows belong to the dairy industry. We were also told that we... Uh, we have a phrase called revolutionizing dairy with plants. We were told that we had to, st uh, we could not use that terminology. We couldn't say revolutionizing uh, dairy because we didn't own the word dairy. Um, and so we sued um, uh, Animal Legal Defense Fund as our uh, lead attorney. We sued um, on our first amendment rights to use the word butter um, with a qualifier all over our packaging, it says cultured vegan butter made from plants, et cetera. And uh, we don't think there's any confusion in the marketplace. Um, we believe that the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture was at, working on the behest of uh, the dairy industry here in California, because it's the largest, uh, I think next to Wisconsin, it's the largest, we're the largest dairy state in the country. Um, and they've been struggling for a number of years and, and, and dairy sales have been plummeting. Um, so, um, you know, we felt that our First Amendment rights were infringed and it's, uh, I think we're, it's going to court next month. So uh, we're excited about it. We did it. We filed this lawsuit, not just for ourselves, because, you know, we think we're doing everything right. We don't think we're confusing anyone, but also for the entire industry, because uh, food evolves and food uh, is continually evolving. And people need to know what these products are. If I'm using butter, for example, if, if I were to call my European style cultured vegan butter, I don't know, cultured vegan um, cashew uh, spread, people wouldn't know what that is. Is it, a, is it like a cashew butter? Well, that uses butter, the word butter too. People would not know what it was they wouldn't know that it's a one-for-one one swap with dairy butter and you can bake with it, cook with it, brown it, laminate dough, make pie crust out of it, et cetera. And so we, you know, because we're not going to get rid of people's cooking habits or eating habits overnight, um, we have to name these products 
uh, let them know what it's an equivalent of so people have an idea of what to do with it. Um, it sounds like a desperate move on their part. I think it is definitely, yeah, it's definitely a, a desperate move um, because the industry is changing, consumer behavior is changing. Um, yes. I, I remember there was a lawsuit with uh, Chick-fil-A. Some guy had made these adorable t-shirts that say eat more kale, of which I have too. My friend Kenny Malcolm gave them to me. And he, he sued the guy, this little t-shirt guy, because he said their logo was eat more chicken. And it's going to confuse people because apparently people are so stupid. They can't tell the difference between a Chick-fil-A and a beef mm -hmm. of kale. Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's absolutely absurd. I, there, it's a desperate industry. They're going to get more and more desperate. And uh, yeah, this is our opportunity. So we fully believe we're going to win. Well, congratulations. I like what you said about plant-based too, because I don't, even though I'm vegan and proud to be it, I never liked the word plant-based because to me that was so ambiguous because plant-based, plant predominant, plant strong, you could still be eating a lot of your calories from animal products or processed food. It, it's not, it's not descriptive. So when I use the word plant, I say I'm plant exclusive, different. But that's, that's very different. In fact, plant base is now being co-opted by the industry. I mean, there was a discussion um, in a trade group where one of the big companies wanted the meaning, you know, I'm, I'm a founding member of the plant-based foods association, which is a, a trade organization for, the plant-based industry, because that's the terminology that's used. And uh, there, were, you know, there were our companies, uh, big corporations that are getting into the industry, and they want to change the meaning of plant-based, so it's not plant exclusive. They want to be able to use a little bit of milk, a little bit of, you know, a few eggs here and there, and still be able to call it plant-based, because it's based on plants, but it has other things in it. And so there are, you know, there was a, a, a vegan meat, well, it wasn't a vegan meat. It was a, um, there were these uh, like pastrami slices or something. And it said plant-based on it. I bought it, took it home. I uh, didn't read the ingredients. My daughter started reading the ingredients. She goes, this isn't vegan. It's got egg whites in it. Um, and so people are using the word, people in the industry are using the word to, in, they're interpreting it any way they want. Uh, you can't interpret the word vegan. Vegan means, ex you know, exclusively plants. You're not eating any animal products at all. And it can go beyond that. You know, I'm not the vegan police. I'm not going to argue. Be I think a good place to start is get rid of animal products out of your diet, get rid of them. And then over time, it's a journey. Veganism is a journey. So, you know, eventually you can get rid of the leather. You can get rid of the wool over time. Um, but, um, you know, I'm good with someone calling themselves vegan. If they go vegan today and they just get, they just stop eating animal products. So. Yeah, great. You know, the people that, even if people aren't going to be vegan, and I hope everyone will come to that conclusion as the safest, sanest, and best thing to do for your health, the planet, and the animals. It's, we always recommend, or at least those of us that teach, you know, a healthy versions of plant-based, that everybody should at least give up dairy. That That's like the first step. And as you mentioned, many cultures don't even consume milk. They're already lactose intolerant or have allergies. But for people that are using cheese to medicate, because I remember when Howard Lyman, when I interviewed him, he said it was harder to stop cheese than smoking, uh, that want that casomorphine reaction, can they get them from the vegan cheeses? Can they get that little hit of whatever they're looking for? I think so. Um, you know, that's what we're told anyway. I mean, you're not gonna get the casomorphine hit for sure, um, but you don't want that. I mean, you don't want an addictive su substance, but you can definitely get all the flavor profiles, you know, the unctuous quality of vegan cheeses. Um, you know, we're told all the time that they were able to give up dairy because of our cheeses. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, people that are on my mailing list, and I will give you guys a link to be on it, they get to send in questions and we always give them priority. And so here's a question from Janice. And she says, well, she's a huge fan and she says lots of nice things and how you've made a big difference in her life. But she says, is it possible to create a vegan ranch dressing that tastes like the Hidden Valley one so many of us grew up on? Every version that I've tried tastes nothing like the Hidden Valley one. Good question. I couldn't tell you because I don't think I've ever had the Hidden Valley one. Um, you know, I, I tell a, in the homemade vegan pantry, I do have a recipe for ranch dressing and it is oil free, by the way. Um, but 
Um, I grew up in a household that didn't have bottled dressing. Um, when I was a kid growing up, my mother always made her own dressing. So, um, you know, I would, I always look forward to going to a friend's house where they have bottles of dressing, but I can't tell you if I've ever had the Hidden Valley one. <laughs> so I don't know. What's it like? Well, it, it's, it's very salty. I remember that it came in a little packet and then you would just, I can't even remember, I guess you mix it with buttermilk or something and shook it up. It's been a long time. Ah, since. it's one of those shake, the ones that you shake. I think so. It's been so, and, and now it, it comes bottled too. So you have another book coming out. Could you tell us a little bit about it? What it's about? Sure. Yeah. Out? So I don't know what it's. Well, it's got a very. I we may be fudging with the title, but it's the same publisher as the Homemade Vegan Pantry, Ten Speed Random House, and they asked me to write a book on on vegan meat, on how to cook with all the vegan meats that are available, as well as how to make your own. So DIY vegan meat. So. Uh, I, I wrote it, uh, it's, the pho it's, pho it's being photographed next week. Uh, it should be out sometime early next year. I think next spring or so. Um, so it's about vegan meat and not necessarily oil-free. Um, it's really kind of, you know, I would call that a transition book. It's for a lot of people that are trying to get off of meat. And, you know, I'm not just about, as I mentioned before, it's not just about health for me. It's getting people away from animal agriculture, getting them off of dairy, getting them off of, of meat. I personally don't eat a lot of, I mean, like when I finished writing this book, I was like, I, okay, let me, I don't eat a lot of meat substitutes. Um, I was so glad when I didn't have to test vegan meat recipes anymore. I was so, I was like, I just want to get back to eating my kale and my beans and my rice, you know? So um, it's definitely a, a transition book. Um, or for people that are vegan, but, you know, they're just not into beans and greens like we are. Um, that's how I prefer to eat. Um, I feel best when I'm eating uh, lots of vegetables. We talk, we've talked about this before. Um, and so, honestly, testing these recipes for several months was, um, it was not, you know, I, let's just say I didn't feel my best. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty funny. I was like, I just got to get this book done because I don't want to cook, you know, another uh, meat substitute again. But I do have some recipes in there that are really clean, oil-free, um, that are made out of things like mushrooms and lentils rather than, uh, you know, just beyond meat or seitan. So there are wheat, there are gluten-free and uh, oil-free recipes in there. That's great. Well, hopefully they won't sue you, say, using vegan meat. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I don't think they will, but, but maybe, who knows? Bring yeah. it on, that's all I can say. So Shannon says, what does a normal day of eating look like for you? A normal day of what? I'm sorry. Of eating. A, a normal, day, oh, a normal of day. day of eating. Okay, well, it's changed over time, but at this point, I, I mainly do uh, kind of like intermittent fasting, so... Um, I usually take my first meal around, um, I don't know, maybe 11 a.m. And it's usually a lot of vegetables, salads, beans, maybe some grains. Um, I eat here at Miyoko's. We have um, about 130 employees and we have uh, a full-time kitchen crew that prepares meals for our entire, uh, vegan meals for our entire staff. So we have a buffet line and we have a big salad bar. So I usually, and then there's lots of vegetables. So I usually just like make myself a big platter of vegetables. That's kind of how I break my fast. And then, um, you know, I go home and I make dinner. And uh, when I'm not writing cookbooks about vegan meat, then it's, it's, um, it's, there's always a grain of some sort, you know, it's brown rice or quinoa or something like that. And there's always lots of vegetables and uh, I'm not hundred percent oil free, but um, I use very, I don't cook with a lot of oil. Um, on, uh, and then occasionally, you know, we make something like a really wonderful, rich pasta. Um, but for the most part, you know, I, I like to eat very fresh, um, vegetables, grains, beans, probably very simply, um, lots of bowls for dinner. Um, well, I've been to your house and I know you do eat very healthfully. And even though I, you did work for the McDougal program for many years, I did. Oil -free. Yeah. did you enjoy that experience in cooking those? Yeah, things? I cooked, for, I, I was in the, I taught in the McDougal program for about 10 years, in fact. So, and it was, you know, like once or twice a month. 
um, cooking oil-free meals. So um, and that was a lot of fun. I really uh, miss that. I just can't do it anymore. I had to make a choice when I started this company. Thank you. Stephanie says Miyoko is a treasure in our country. We are so lucky. That when yeah. did you, you, you're just a couple of years older than me, I think maybe one or two. When did you first become vegan? Well, I don't, you know, it was in the mid eighties. I, I don't have, I don't have a vegan anniversary. I know you do, but I don't have one. Um, and I was a cheating vegan the first few years and I cheated on cheese. That was my cheat because um, I just couldn't pass up a good pizza once in a while. So I was, you know, I was that 99% vegan and once in a while I would cheat on pizza or brie. Um, but it was back, I don't know. So I guess it's 2020 and 1985, maybe. So how long is that? 35 years, something like that. That's pretty that right? good. Did you, grow up, did you grow up eating traditional Japanese food? Well, I did initially, yeah. I, I mean, I was born in Japan, moved to the United States when I was seven. And my mother had to learn how to cook American. Um, so I had cheese. I remember my very first experience with cheese. Um, I was probably about eight years old and it was on a cheese pizza. And it was the most disgusting thing I'd ever eaten because you know, when a Japanese diet is typically, I mean, it's, it's always rice. There's noodles sometimes, but it's very rice heavy. And you have little bits of other things like a little bit of miso soup, and you have a little bit of vegetable, maybe a piece of fish, something like that. But it's very simple food, very, very simple. And, uh, you know, it's not rich. So cheese was like rich and cloying. And I remember it getting caught in my throat. And I just had no idea how people would eat this way. I thought it was disgusting. So it's kind of funny when you think about the fact that I really didn't eat meat until I was about seven. And then I became a vegetarian when I was 12. So I only ate meat for five years in my life, and I just wrote a vegan meat cookbook. So the, the least expert person on vegan meat and cheese wrote books on vegan meat and cheese. It's kind of funny. That's, a, that's great. They're asking if you have any, do you teach any cooking classes, particularly ones where you teach people how to make cheese either in person or online? I don't anymore. I mean, I used to in person. Um, the only way you can catch my cooking shows are now online when we do uh, Facebook Live uh, on our Miyoko's Home Comfort shows. I will be doing a cheese making class tomorrow on Miyoko's Home Comforts. So I'll be uh, showing folks how to make uh, an oil free mozzarella tomorrow. Well, this is perfect then. This is perfect that you came on today because that's something I definitely want to watch. Yeah. That so is super fantastic. easy. Miyoko's Home Comforts, three o'clock on Facebook Live. Um, not my personal page, it's the Miyoko's Cream Rate page. And if, and if they missed it, it, it will stay there. They can watch it later if they, they can. can. watch it later and it's on YouTube also. That's great. So there's a question from Ra. Can your butter be used to make the equivalent of an Indian ghee? Yes, you can clarify it. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because there's actual milk solids made from cashew milk in it. And so it can be clarified. The milk solids will sort of separate and you can pour uh, that on. That's not an oil-free question though. <laughs> That's okay. And then there's another cheese question from, uh, but where did it go? Plast, it looks like. Any ideas for a substitute for a Mexican cojita cheese? Huh, okay, so that, um, is another cheese I have to somehow plead ignorance about uh, because I gave up cheese so long ago uh, in the 1980s before, um, at the time that I gave up, so I was living in Japan. I left the United States in 1980. Um, prior to that, Mexican food was not super popular in, even in, where I lived in Nor NorCal. Um, maybe it was a little different in SoCal but there really wasn't a whole lot of it in NorCal at the time. And it just completely blew up. I remember coming back to the United States eight, nine, 10 years later and Mexican food was everywhere. And, but it was like back then, you know, Thai food wasn't around either. So there were tacos from Taco Bell, things like that. But um, 
really, I don't think I ever had fat. So I don't even know what it, I think it's a dry cheese. Is it sort of dry? It, to me, it sort of almost looks like, like cottage, cottage cheese. cheese. It's white it's and pie, kind of, right? like little crumbles in a way. Yeah. It's, they're saying it's similar to feta. It's similar to, so if that's similar to feta, okay. In the homemade vegan pantry, there is an oil-free feta cheese recipe. It's really good. And you could probably, there's a, a one, there's a, a one month period of brining. You have to brine the cheese for a month to get it to taste like feta. But if you were to skip that process, I bet it would taste like that. Wow. Have you been back to Japan at all lately? Uh, not for about two years. Um, and so my son, I'm going to be a grandma next month, June 4th. My son's having a baby. And of course I can't go back because of, uh, you know, there's a mandatory 14 day quarantine. And I mean, it's just, so yeah, you know, I'm going to have to be a grandma just uh, virtually for a while. Well, congratulations. Because I haven't been to Japan since I think it was 1994, but I noticed they starting to eat more like Americans and they're starting to look more like Americans. Yeah, they are. But there's also 200 vegan restaurants in Tokyo alone. And veganism is on the rise. That's fantastic. I still, what I loved about Japan is that they were a vegetable, they eat, whatever they eat in addition, they eat a lot of vegetables. And that's where I first learned about the concept of vegetables for breakfast, because I was there to do a television show. I used to be a comedian and I was in one of the best hotels in Tokyo. And that's basically what they served me for breakfast in Japan. It was miso soup with vegetables, steamed rice and salad. Yes. Yeah. It's very funny. Japanese eat salad for breakfast. <laughs> well, they're smart. Yeah. Uh, D Dina Marie says, can you make a plant-based sausage without oil? Um, I know that Nutmeg Notebook, who's been on the show, does have a recipe for that. But what, what say you about that? Uh, you definitely could do that. Yeah. I mean, you could, you know, the only thing about oil is it adds a little bit of, of juiciness, but you don't, you definitely don't need it. Just, I would substitute more broth or something. That's great. Didn't can't didn't you used to do that kind of ex, what is it called burpees? Didn't you used to do a lot of those? Oh, burpees! That's funny. Yeah, I used, yeah. You know, it, I, last year I did a uh, right around now in May I participated in this bicycle race called Campo Velo, and I'm not a bicyclist, um, but um, I ended up uh, riding 60 miles and uh, hadn't done it hadn't done it before. And two days later, I got a herniated disc. And I couldn't exercise for about six months. I mean, I was in so much pain. Um, so I haven't done burpees now in over a year because I'm afraid that it, it'll, you know, I, I just make sure that whatever exercise I'm doing doesn't disrupt my spine. So, but yes, burpees. Yeah. Why do you mention burpees? No, I just, I just remembered you. I, I, I don't know why I think I remember you doing them sometime in front of me. It just seems like. I, I think I did it like in a talk. It was part of a, it was kind of a joke, you know, it's, it, I had this business talk I used to give about how I failed so many times, but life is just like a burpee. You got, you jump, you get down on the ground, then you jump, you have to jump back up higher than you did before. And it's that resilience that's required to, uh, you know, um, in, in the line of work we're in. Yeah, you're so serious. You're a great speaker, very inspirational. I'm guessing you probably don't have time for this, but people love to know if you are reading anything or maybe watching something on Netflix, what do you like to do in the little spare time you have? Huh. You know, it's really weird. I, I used to be such an avid reader and uh, I haven't been able, and what I, I love non, I love fiction and I haven't been able to concentrate. I haven't been able to like let my mind go in that. So the last few years, I've really only been reading books on business which is boring, but since the coronavirus hit, um, in my spare time, um, I've been catching up on Ozark. So <laughs> it's it's so fun to see what people like to watch. Like I couldn't believe like Tom Campbell, he likes like the violent shows, and that's so cool. I just love to hear what other people like. Okay, but I do study Italian, so I we watch a lot of Italian movies, uh, a lot of Italian serials. I listen to a lot of Italian tapes, so. That sounds like fun. That's, That's my fun. spare time. Yeah. Learning you... Italian, shoveling manure and watching Ozark. <laughs> That's hilarious. Now I know that for now, anything, everything seems to be canceled, but do you think you have any things coming up big, like any, any appearances that we could see you at? No, everything's been canceled for the year. I was supposed to be in China last month. I was supposed to be in the UK last month. Um, 
you know, there's I'm supposed to be in Korea in September. I don't think that's happening. Um, and then, of course, lots of things locally and uh, in the United States, but it's pretty much all been canceled for this year. So um, no, just 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 on Facebook Live or on the Chef AJ show. That's it. Right? Any any new products or flavors that we can look forward to? Yeah. So we just launched our new slices and shreds that are made out of uh, oat milk and legumes. Uh, we've got new products coming out later on this year. I can't really speak to because um, don't want to give away our secrets yet. But um, so we've got we've got more stuff coming out. And uh, you know what I want to do is is become. Uh, get more on to developing technologies for transforming uh, the certain certain uh, properties in plants to transform them through fermentation and other processes so they act like dairy. And so that's what we're working on right now. That sounds fantastic. So what's your all-time favorite meal? Oh, okay. I used to tell this. So I have a friend who has her, her mother, Hazel, her, her mother's name is Hazel. She's, Penelope is of a, a Asian, de, a Malaysian descent, but Hazel used to make this vegan mock duck. And it was yuba that was wrapped around all these vegetables and then sticky rice. And I could not, oh, and then bitter, bitter melon. So it was this combination of sauteed bitter melon and then the sticky rice and then the mock duck. And she would make it for me all the time. And I used to say that if I had to have my last meal, that would be it. That's so cool. That's really cool. You know what I forgot to ask you? And by the way, Edith says her Costco has Miyoko's butter. So that's fantastic. Yeah. That's cool. So in, in so many cheese or faux cheese recipes, uh, there's nutritional yeast as an ingredient. And there's some people that truly can't have it. They're not trying to be difficult. Either it's an allergy or an intolerance. How can people get that flavor when they really cannot have nutritional yeast or is it just impossible? Well, first of all, nutritional yeast is not in, it, it's not in a lot. So uh, nutritional yeast is often used in recipes where there's no fermentation because you want an immediate cheesy flavor. So if you actually ferment, you don't necessarily need to use nutritional yeast. Um, so we have some cheeses like our mozzarella doesn't have nutritional yeast in it and it still tastes cheesy. Um, and it's through the process of fermentation. So you can achieve that through that. Um, you can also, inc you can add miso. Miso adds a certain amount of cheesiness and umami that nutritional yeast also has. So when I make pesto, for example, to substitute for the Parmesan cheese, I use miso. I think that's a great substitute for that. Wow, that's great. Um, there's a question if you're enjoying having a little bit more at home time since everything was canceled. Oh my God, absolutely. Um, for the first uh, few, few weeks, it was like, I just love being home. Um, you know, it's getting a little old now, but at least I do come to work. I'm at the office right now. Um, but I was so sick of traveling. I was getting to a point where I didn't know how much more I could do, I could handle, you know. Just like you, I was on the road constantly. Um, I practically lived at SF, you know, at, uh, whatever it's called. I don't even remember. What's the name of our airport? SFO. Um, and I do, so unlike you, AJ, I, I would do a lot of these uh, 24 hour trips. I'd fly out one day, to, let's say to Minneapolis or New York. I'd have a morning meeting the next day and then I would fly back home that afternoon. So I was literally doing these, you know, 24, I could, I wasn't staying there for two nights. Um, I didn't even want to stay, I just wanted to get home. So, but you know, a 24 hour trip can be pretty exhausting. And I did these all the time. Um, so I'm so glad to be home. Um, and then all the events on weekends, not being, you know, being away from my family, being away from the animals. Um, honestly, I'm kind of a homebody. I love being home. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I, I don't wish anyone any harm from this in finances or health, but for me, it's just been a blessing. Yeah. Well, it's so great. You look great. You sound great. I am sorry for your loss in your sanctuary, but I really appreciate you coming on anyway. Oh, well, okay. I was going to say goodbye, but there's a question. I think I know the answer, but oh, does Miyoko have a dog or a cat? Two dogs, four cats. Wow. Very good. That, that, I, that's the hardest part about travel is you miss your pets so much. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You feel guilty. So 
I know there's hey do all your dogs and cats get along with all the farm animals absolutely no problem at all that's cool hey you know remember I met you because I, I came and did an episode of your tv show is that still available anywhere for people to see yeah it's on that plant-based network that's out you know um you know that plant-based network do you have anything on there I don't know. Is it called Plant Based News or Plant Based Network? I'll look it up. Oh, Plant Based Network. Okay, I'm going to look. I'll, it up. I'll try to send you a link. So there, it's on Roku. Okay, you cool. can download it on Roku and see all these vegan shows, all these plant based shows. Cool, because that's yeah. um, that's where I met. So to, so guys, my show is a little later tomorrow. I didn't know Miyoko was going live at three, but it's quite all right to go watch her show tomorrow at three because she's making mozzarella. I'm going to be interviewing Margaret from the Body Deli. It's a, a line of amazing just skincare that's like all vegan. It's amazing. And because people are always ask me about my skin. And the reason I'm going so late tomorrow is because in case you don't know, Dr. Greger has a four hour free webinar on the pandemic. And I don't have the information to post, but if you go to nutritionfacts.org, you should be able to see that. So it's been so great catching up with you. I hope it's not as long this time. So uh, thank you so much again for all your work for the planet, for the animals and for human health as well. It was great seeing you, AJ. Take care. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.